centered, okay? Facebook watching us tonight. I want to thank all of you who are here with us also this evening. I am so excited about that. We finally finished chapter 11. But if you think the story of Lazarus and Jesus raising him up is over, it's not. The story now continues on actually in chapter 12. That's where we're headed tonight. So I invite you at this time, those of you at home, those of you here with me, to open up your Bibles to chapter 12. And as we Open up God's Word. I want to open us up now to God's Spirit and pray for our time together. Gracious, loving Heavenly Father, thank you once again for the gift of this day, for the gift of this evening. But most importantly, we thank you for the gift of this church. In this time that we can be together, one with each other, with you, through the power of your Spirit. We thank you for the Gospel of John. Most importantly, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for this written word, dear God, your living, life-giving word. And so you lead us and guide us now. It's only you and you alone can do. Let this be, once again, about you as it should be in everything that we do. And give us something new tonight, new from these great old stories that we've heard all our lives. Give us some insight and wisdom that will take us to the next level in our relationship with you. We ask all this in your holy, mighty, and very precious name. Amen. All right, well, let's continue on now. So the next thing that goes on here, beginning with uh, chapter 12, I want to read verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to, st and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. When the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest planned to put Lazarus to death as well. Since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were, were deserting and were believing in Jesus. All right, so once again, we have Jesus back at the home of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. And in telling us this, John does something very specific. First off, he points out three things about Lazarus, Martha, and Mary. Now, there in verses 1 and 2, right off the bat, you know, we're told this is the home of Lazarus, whom he, Jesus, had raised from the dead. But what is the really important Okay? What's the really interesting thing that John wants us to know about Lazarus? There in verse 2. That Lazarus is that he's sitting at the table with him. Now why is that so important? Because he's been raised from the dead, but it's more than that. It's not actually what? Because can a corpse eat? So it means what? This is actually what? It's proof. <laughs> this is, huh? He's a living body. If this was not a fluke, and it's not, he's not a zombie or anything like that. He is a really true living human being. So once again, John points this out. And remember, John does these little subtle things. You have to stop sometimes and just think. Ask yourself that question. Why would John put that in there? Okay? Why would John say that? Well, like I said, he wants us to make sure that Raising Lazarus from the dead, it wasn't a clue. That it wasn't something that just, you know, that he really didn't live. Sitting at the table eating is more proof that this really did happen. Now also, then in verse 2, we're also told that Martha is there. And we're told that Martha is what? Serving. serving. She's serving. Now once again, now if you read this story, there's no reason for that in there, is it? 
I mean, you can just say, you know, Lazarus is there, Martha is there, but he says what? He doesn't say that Martha's there. Martha is serving. Now, why do you think it's important to John for him to add this one just very small, seemingly insignificant fact about Martha? Why do you think he does this? Then? All right, okay, very good. I hadn't thought about that. A contrast. Marcia says there's a, maybe to show the contrast between the two sisters. Well, well Martha did, though. Martha was very good. This is Martha, okay? This is Martha. So in telling us this, John is letting us know that Martha is staying true to what? To who she is, her character, who she is. She loved Jesus. And for her, the best way to show her love was by doing what? Serving him. Doing what? Working with her hands. Being up, doing things. And like I said, remember, John loves to insert these little things in there. So for me, it's John's way of just letting us know that serving Jesus with your hands, like Martha does, is just as important as what? Praising Him, or sitting on His feet like Mary does, serving Him, you know, using your hands to serve Him, is also just as important as somebody that does what? Maybe stands up and preaches, you know, or somebody that teaches the Sunday school. You know, the thing is, Martha had always gotten the bad rap, hadn't she? You know, but the thing is, Jesus loves her. And he, I think he loves the fact that this is who she is. She's a worker. She is my mom. Okay, I'll be honest with you. My mom was not going to get up here. She would sooner just die than have had to get up in front of people and speak. But I tell you what, if you had said, Elvie, I need your help in the kitchen, she'd have been right there and she would have taken care of everything for me. And she would not want you to mention her in any way. That's Martha. And so for Jesus, it's just as important. But now look at verse 3. But it is Mary's role in the story that though they're all important, for John, Mary's role in this seems to be the, the biggest thing, the most important thing that he wants, us to, wants to tell us about. But before we get into what Mary does, okay, we first need to stop and take a look at something that John also did concerning Mary, Back in chapter 11. Remember, when I threw with the story of chapter 11. Let's go back. So what did John make sure to point out in the opening verses of chapter 11? Okay? About Mary. There in chapter, the opening verse of, of chapter 11, John points out what? Very, very specific about Mary. Alright, but look at verse 2. Uh, okay, but look again. Look, what does it say here in chapter 11, verse 2? Very good. Thank you, Miss Lee. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. All right? Now, why is it import, important that we remember this brief statement from chapter 11, verse 2, as we now come to 12, 3? It's very important that we remember this, okay? Well, some people read these two verses. They read this. And they think John has done what with his gospel message? Huh? No, not probably well, not prophesied necessarily. But concerning the story that John has actually done what? That he's gotten out of what? Huh? Order. Out of chronological order. Some people look at that and they don't want to say this. They don't want to say, well, that he's telling it out of chronological order. That he mentions this in 11. But he doesn't tell it, because when you look at it, it makes it sound like it's something that had already happened. You know? It makes it sound like when you read it, Mary and her sister Martha, now Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. It makes it sound like it's something that had already happened. But then we get to chapter 12, and what? Now we get the story. So it's, some people will claim that he got the timeline wrong. Which enables what? Some critics then want to use something that simple to do what? To try and discredit the Bible. They don't look for any little thing, okay? But I don't believe that John has got anything out of order in telling us about these two events. 
You see, now I believe that what John is doing back in chapter 11, verse 2, is something that I myself have done. You've done the same thing many times, right, when you're telling a story. He is simply reminding the readers of what? Of who Mary is. You know? I mean, because don't forget, how many Marys do we know of so far in Jesus' story? About three. Mary is mother. <laughs> Mary Magdalene. And now we have Mary, sister of Lazarus. So we got at least three of them, right? So, you know, another way that John could have written this is if he could have said there in chapter 11, you know, Lazarus of been a village of Mary and a sister of Martha. Now, you remember this Mary. She's the one that anointed Jesus' feet with the oil and wiped it with her hair. You see, many times I forgot maybe a person's name, but if you remind me of the event, I can say, oh, yeah, that was so-and-so. So in a way, he's not yeah, he's got the timeline wrong. People knew about Mary by this point. Remember, all this stuff has happened. Then John, probably maybe 50 years after it all, completes his gospel. So everybody knows the story of Mary. So in his way, what he's doing, he's not got any kind of chronological order after chapter 11. Oh, don't remember that, Mary. She's the one that did so and so. Then he comes to the story. All right? So why did you know, so he didn't really get it out of order or anything. But let us now get into what Mary actually does at this dinner party, okay? Now, as we know, first off, Mary takes somehow the word pound. Anybody got the word point? Huh? Pound? Pound? Pint. Okay. Pint. Pint? Okay, pint. Got point. We've got pint. We've got pound. Anything else besides any other measuring? Twelve ounces. Ounces. Twelve ounces. Okay. What is the, uh, the Greek of litros, all the way about 25 liters. Uh, five liters, okay. The thing is, we really don't know there's a lot of different possibilities, but basically we know it's a pure nard, this perfume, and she does what? She pours it over the feet of Jesus. Now with this perfume, this oil, like I said, there's not really much we know about it. Most likely it's a perfume that's extracted from the roots of a plant that comes from the land that we now know as India. Okay, it wasn't known as India back then, but we know it came from the land of India. It's expensive. How much does it, is it worth? Does John tell us? A year's wage. Now, you've got to remember, folks, a year's wage, that was a lot of money back then. Okay? And we know for sure that Mary does not apply a small amount of the perfume. That from the way John describes it, Mary uses the what? The whole thing, the entire amount of perfume on Jesus' feet. Okay? That from the way John describes it, okay, this is what we believe from the way John describes it. But more importantly for John, it was not that Mary used up an entire bottle of its first expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. What is the thing you really believe that stands out to John the most? And she wipes it with her hair. I think that's what stood out more to him than anything else. Well, we well we don't know that for sure. There's still some questions. Good possibility that that's it. Because there was an oil that could be used in burial preparation. And one of the things we're going to talk about is that. You know, was Jesus properly prepared? And you look at the end of the Gospels, we do know that he was wrapped in a towel that contained spices in it. But we don't know if it was... But we're not really sure. Because the bottom line is, this could have been just a very expensive perfume that she owned. That she had bought. There's this very good possibility that it's just something that maybe was passed down from her mother to her. We don't really know for sure. We do know that there was a burial procedure in which oil was anointed. We know Jesus was wrapped in, like I said, the cloth with the spices. We, you know, and that they came, were supposed to come back, what, on the third day, because everything's so close to Friday evening, and finish preparing him and everything. So they probably would have used the oil then. But for Mary, I think it's much more to all this, this perfume and her hair. 
Alright, so the question now becomes, why does Mary do this? Why was doing this so important to Mary? Well, first, in her own way, Mary was simply showing her what? Her Jesus. Her love and respect. But also, there's a third thing she's also showing. She's also showing her what? Her thankfulness. It's her thankfulness to Jesus. See, in pouring out all the perfume on Jesus, Mary is showing that in her love for Jesus, she's, first off, she's willing to do what? She pours it all out. So, this expensive perfume that could have been an heirloom, it could have been, it could have been something that she bought, okay? But the thing is, she does what with it? She pours it all out there on this feet, which means that she won. She gave up her worldly possessions. Okay, well, she gave up her worldly possessions. But what else could it have been? I like that she gave up her worldly possessions. But in pouring all this on his feet, that she was willing to not do what? She was not going to do what? Keep any of it. Or, what, or in other ways, she wasn't going to hold anything back. She was not going to hold anything back for him that her love and devotion for Jesus meant that she was willing to give him what? All she had. If she gives to Jesus all that she has, she gives to him. But in this way, Mary is also showing how thankful she was to Jesus for bringing her back. Lazarus. Lazarus for bringing her brother back. So, what she, what, she was so thankful that she was willing to give her most expensive possession to him to show her love and her thankfulness to him, okay? But here's the second thing. In only using the perfume on Jesus' feet and then her hair to dry his feet, Mary is showing more also than just her love and her gratitude, her thankfulness. She's also showing her what? By placing it only on his feet, she shows what? How about her humility, her humbleness, you know, toward Jesus? You see, to truly honor someone, the usual way to do it was by anointing the, the what? If you want to order how? the top of the head, you want to anoint the top of the head, okay? But Mary's love was such an humble love for Jesus, she didn't feel worthy enough to do that. So she does what? She chooses to anoint his feet. In doing this, Mary is seeking, yes, she wants to honor Jesus. The thing is, she just didn't feel what? Worthy. She didn't feel worthy enough herself to perform such an honor on Jesus. So that's why she uses her feet. Okay? I mean, he uses his feet. But it was in using her hair that I could say, I wish to stand out the most far. See, Mary knew that she was a what? She was still a what? A sinful woman. She was a woman still lost in her sins. That she was no different from the sinful woman that Luke tells us about in his gospel account back in chapter 7, starting with verse 36. That's why she had no problem with taking her hair down and using it to wipe Jesus' feet. Because you've got to realize something. Back in this time, no respectable woman would ever appear in public with her hair loose and hanging down. Okay? How many of you, your grandmas were just like my grandmother, hair always tight and in a bun? Never that I think I saw my grandmother's hair down one time. She had long hair. And hers was white as could be except for one black streak that went down. And I saw her one time with her hair down. And all the other times I remember my grandmother tied up and in a bun. Because you see, a respectable woman wasn't seen that. With her hair down, okay? Mary knew this. Even a woman, and this doesn't apply to Mary, because we don't believe she was married. But even on the day that a woman got married, her hair would be bound up, and never again would she be seen in public with it down. The reason why is because if a woman, if a woman unbound her hair and let it hang down in public, it meant that she was a what? Huh? Well, prostitute. Or any moral or a sinner, okay? Anything like that, okay? But Mary knows who she is, okay? Mary knew she was, but more importantly, because of her action of love and thankfulness and humility, she was now showing to the world how Jesus has actually done what? Changed her. 
given her a new life. A life that's not bound by the views or the beliefs of this world. She doesn't worry about what others think. She just loves Jesus. And that's what she wants everybody to know. And that's what she wants Jesus to know here. But the last thing, look at the last part of verse 3. What is the last thing that John tells us about what Mary did? Or concerning what Mary did? That I love this. The house was filled with the fragrance of the oil, or the fragrance of the perfume. Now, of course, we can take this exactly in the way that John writes it, okay? But for the early church leaders, members of the early church, this statement actually became so much more. You see, for the early church, church members, this was John's way of telling them that the whole church should always be filled with one. That the whole church should always be filled with one. The fragrance, okay, the fragrance of heaven. First off, maybe about the memory of what Mary did. What did Mary do? She humbled herself. She loved God. She didn't worry about what other people thought, okay? But more importantly, it's a reminder for us, the church, to never forget that we're also supposed to do what? Huh? Same thing. Love God. Love Jesus. Be thankful. Humble ourselves before Him. Isn't that a wonderful metaphor to kind of think about? That this is what, this should fill our church every time we meet. Is the fragrance of Jesus. Or to remind us of Mary. Remind us of who we are supposed to be. And I just love that when I came across that in one of my reference books. How they talked about that. How that's how the early church fathers found it. Or, you know, they interpreted it this way. So Mary has done all this. Now let's get to verses 4, 5, and 6. Now, as we see, everyone at the dinner is apparently okay with what Mary did, except for who? Judas Iscariot, okay? And the Judas Iscariot is the one who's what? Uh, but he actually is first what? He's also the one that what? He carried the money. He's in chase the banker, in charge of the money box for Jesus and the disciples. Now look there in verse 5. Now, in making this objection to all this, what specific thing does Judas do to cover his true intentions? He, he tries to sound what? Righteous. Um, righteous. What did you say about that? Pious. Righteous. Pious. Basically, he takes a high moral stand on behalf of who? The poor. <laughs> So, instead of just coming out saying, what he does, he takes this, he tries to be pious, right? Just take a high moral stand on behalf of the poor. And he covers up his intentions by making himself look what? Noble. Noble. To make himself look good. By lying, to make people think that he's actually what? Concerned. That he's not? That he cares about the poor. But as you see there in verse 6, here John reveals to us Jesus' true intentions. That if the perfume was sold, he knows that he would have been put in charge of the money. And instead of being concerned with helping the poor, he was more concerned with what? Helping himself. Helping himself. How much he could steal. And basically he would have stolen all. You know, that's what the scriptures tell us. He would have stolen the entire amount. So, he makes his stand to look good, but all he has is a greedy, sinful heart, okay? But now, to me, this is, we're getting down to the best part of this story here. Look at verse 7. Now, in, re in his response, we actually can see Jesus doing two things. If we look close enough, okay? Now, the first thing we see from Jesus is how Jesus does not do what? What does Jesus not do first? He does not tell her to quit. Okay, well, okay, he doesn't tell her to quit. All right, well, let's go back to the situation that's going on, because apparently that part is over, okay? But the first thing he does not do is what? Okay, uh, very good, very good, that's it. That even though this was the perfect opportunity for him, Jesus still didn't do what? 
he doesn't expose Judas for his true sinful faults concerning the money that could have come from the selling of the perfume. Did you ever think about this? He doesn't do that. This would have been a perfect opportunity. Judas, I know what you're wanting to do. With it. I know what you really want. And he could have just put him out in front of everybody. But he didn't. Okay? Now, the question becomes, why do you think Jesus chose not to expose Judas at this time? And what, of course, we can have all that, that basic answer, well, it wasn't time, it wasn't part of the prophecy. But let's not go there. Okay? What do we think would be the other reason why Jesus chose not to expose Judas at this time? Maybe it was because Jesus wanted to give Judas one. Okay, give him another lesson. What about something else? Give him another what? I'll stop. Opportunity or another second one. Chance. Maybe he wanted to give Judas a second chance. Now, see, the question is this. Who was it that most likely appointed Judas to be the one in charge of the money box? Huh? Who do you think most likely put Jesus, Judas in charge? Jesus did. Jesus did it because he knew that Judas has what? The capabilities and know-how to do a good job with this money if he wanted what? He wanted to. If he wanted to do it. Jesus knows him. He knows he can do it if he wanted to do it. You see, to me, this is a great example, once again, of not only how Jesus is always willing to give us second chances, third chances, four, and on and on chances. It's also a great reminder of what concerning Jesus? That Jesus never won. Gives up on us. He didn't come here to condemn us. Uh, and, it's, and it's the same thing with Jesus. Yes, he knows who Jesus is. And we're not going to get into argument if Jesus have a choice or anything like that, okay? That's a whole other thing. I hope maybe we'll get to it at the end of the, when we get to the story here of the crucifixion. But the bottom line is I love that. I just love that thought that he knows him, but he's not going to give up on him. He gives him another chance. Jesus, Jesus never gives up on him. But then the second thing that Jesus does, now Mr. Uh, Mr. Harold, Mr. Um, Mr. Harold, I'm coming to you on this one now. The second thing that Jesus does, then he makes sure that Mary is not what? Now, yes, you're right. He makes sure she doesn't stop, but he also makes sure that she's what? That she's not what? Huh? Not terrified, but she's not what? Embarrassed. Thank you. She's not shamed or embarrassed of what she has done, okay? Which brings us then to this question concerning all this. What does Jesus mean when he says that Mary has done this for the day of his burial? Okay, now this is what we're going to get into with um, close to what Beth Ellen was talking about, okay? What does Jesus mean when he says that Mary has done this for the day of his burial? To answer that, we've got to ask another question, okay? Did Mary know that this is what she was actually doing? Does Mary know this is what she's doing? Probably not. Well, Jesus knew what she did it for. She didn't know, he didn't know, or she didn't know that she was going to use it right then. Right. She bought it for him, and then when he was crucified, she had anointed his body with the perfume. Well, see, the thing is, I said it, I said earlier, we don't know if she actually bought it for him. It could have been a fairly family heirloom. It, very easily, she could have bought it for this to honor him with this and everything. And she could have bought it, like I said, just for this occasion. But the question is, was she actually doing it for this purpose? And what Mr. Hale was getting into, what, where I'm headed. So you stay on top of this with me now, because you're, 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 you skipped a few lines <laughs> of where we're headed, okay? You see, we really don't know the exact meaning and purpose of what Jesus means when he says this about Mary's actions. A great way to possibly answer this is to then ask the third question, a third question here. Is Mary doing the exact same thing that Caiaphas did back in chapter 11, verse 50? Now go back to chapter 11, verse 50. And what was it exactly that Caiaphas did at that moment? Concerning Jesus. Remember we talked about it last week. 
Okay, he predicted the future. He gave a prophecy concerning what? The death of who? Of Jesus, okay? The thing is, he talks about the death of one so that what? The nation, the many, the people can survive. The problem with Congress was what? When he made that prophecy, he did not know what? That they were going to crucify Jesus. Well, that they were going to crucify him, but he also didn't know what? That what he was saying was actually true. You know, and he doesn't understand the broad conception of it. All Caiaphas is seeing is that they're going to kill him to save, you know, Israel. Remember now, we talk about this. Rome was fine as long as you paid your taxes, didn't say bad things about Caesar, were obedient to the laws. Other than that, you could basically run your country the way you wanted to and have your religion and everything. As long as you didn't go against Rome, okay? The thing is, he just sees something, he sees it on a small scale. When the truth is, his prophecy does what? It's a worldwide prophecy. That Jesus is doing this, he's going to die. But it's more than just for the nation of Israel, it's for who? The whole world. The whole world, alright? So the question that comes, is this what Mary's doing? Is Mary basically doing the same thing concerning Jesus? That God is doing? Is Mary prophesying? Concerning the death of Jesus, she just doesn't know what. When or what. How or what. What she's doing. <laughs> she just doesn't know she's doing it. In her own mind, and like Ms. Harry and I, and we talked about, she could have easily gone, been saving up this money, might have been a diary or something. She might have sold a cow. You know, something like that. To have gotten this money, and it's easily, you know, very easy. She got this because she wanted to anoint Jesus. But for her, it was to bring honor. Okay? She wanted to show her love, her respect, her thankfulness to Jesus. See, all we can say for sure on this is that, and Ms. Harold, this is what you said. This is where you skipped ahead to on for me. All right? Mary might not have known. Mary most likely didn't know, just like Caiaphas. But who knew? Jesus. Jesus knew. All we can say for sure is that Jesus knew what was going on. He understood what she was doing. See, Jesus knew that his death was quickly approaching. And that Mary's act of devotion to him was simply the sign that this was soon going to be.